Welcome everybody to today's webinar uh, where we have our fast and furious question and answer session with our resident expert here at Solozo, Brock Gettemeyer. Brock, thanks for joining us for this. Pleasure, looking forward to it. Yeah, so the format is uh, Chris and I have already laid out a few questions that we're gonna throw at Brock uh, to discuss just uh, his advice on PPC on Amazon. And then we, want, we always have the chat open. So we want you guys to throw your questions in at Brock, there's a few requirements. Brock's got to answer the question fast and we're going to roll through as many questions as possible. We'll see if we can do that, Brock. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, so this will be a lot of fun. I just want to get through as many of these as possible. Uh, Chris, you and I are going to alternate the questions. So why don't we just get started? Chris, you take the first question. Sure, sure. So let's <laughs> roll into this, Brock. What do you think about okay. running PPC on day one for a new product? I, I think you should, but I also think day one, you should have reviews. So normally I'll get those reviews first and then like do a full FBA launch. So like, it's a, it's a bit of caveat, but yes, yes, I do. Okay. All right, next question. Keep it rolling. And we'll come back to some of these. Oh yeah. Mm. What is the point of PPC in general? Is it to find keywords or for ranking for specific keywords or both? Oh, I definitely think both. And, and I think the, the other main one here is, is it's really taking sales away from your competitor too. It's taking a larger piece of the pie and that, that shouldn't be understated because I think that there's a lot of people that, yeah, that could definitely value from that. Mm -hmm. Chris, next one. Okay. When we set up campaigns, what are the starting bids you suggest for automatic campaigns and manual campaigns? Yeah, so if you're using uh, something to adjust your bid daily, uh, I normally start the automatic campaigns out actually pretty low. So it depends on the niche, um, but I might even start the automatics at 50 cents or 75 cents, and then I'll let something um, go up over time, such as the optimizer increasing the bid every day, you'll get up to the dollar, dollar 50. If you're selling $20,000 couches or something like that though, you know, you're, obviously you're gonna have to start much, much higher. Um, so yeah, I, I normally in general start things 50 to 75 cents unless you're in a unique niche such as like thousand to $20,000 products. Next up. Okay. All right, here's a good question. How many campaigns are ideal for a product? <laughs> These are supposed to be fast. <laughs> you can take your time on this one. All right. Um, so I think bare minimum, you, you should probably have an automatic to exact match. Now, if you get to the point where you've harvested everything out of your automatic, it's perfectly fine to be running just your exact match. Now, the all of the new advertising methods that have launched over the past year on Amazon, though, I mean, I, I can think of so many people that have switched exclusively to them even, um, such as the sponsor brand videos. I can think of a number of accounts that run nothing but one sponsor brand video for a number of products. And that is the most efficient way we can do it. So I think it depends on your niche, um, where you are in your product life cycle. You know, are you trying to rank? Are you trying to just hold your ranking and maximize your profit because it's in a later stage? Um, I, I'd say at a minimum though, in the past or currently, you should have at least one automatic and one manual. Good stuff. Chris, next one. Next one is what are the different uses for negative keywords? Okay, so I, I lump keywords into two categories, good, good negatives and bad negatives. Um, so bad negatives are, are to cut wasteful spend, right? Um, good negatives are because you are trying to consolidate that volume to a different location. So for example, an automatic campaign, you wanna negate a search term, so that way your exact match can get all of the data needed to make the appropriate decision based on where the bid should be to hit your target A cost. Um, the only other options, in my opinion, that you should use negatives for are, um, I have seen people use blacklists before. Uh, so if you're doing manual bid updates, you might have a list of keywords that you know are bad and you apply those always. So like a blacklist. Um, if you're doing daily bid updates, you really don't need that. Uh, the other option is if you're trying to segment things out. So you might take your sponsored um, or your branded spend, for example. Let's say you have that in a separate campaign because you have goals you want to hit for branded spend. That's another great reason why you might want to actually use a phrase negative in your automatic and um, non-branded campaign. 
So I, I use exact negative 99% of the time, and I use phrase negatives only for those situations where you are trying to control something like all branded terms, not spending this campaign. Perfect. Very good. All right, next question. What do you recommend one ad group per campaign to be able to manage the budget per ad group instead of per campaign? Hmm. Question. Okay. So I think it depends on how many SKUs you have. Uh, if, you, if you're running 40,000 SKUs, uh, you know, that can, that can get overwhelming really quick. Uh, that having said, if you're running uh, 50 SKUs, there's, there's really no reason not to just have one, one ad group per campaign and have, you know, 50, 100 campaigns. Um, Again, if you get into the um, wholesale model um, where you're constantly churning through uh, products that you won't ever sell again, that is a great situation though where you might actually want to have um, multiple ad groups and have categories of products lumped under one budget. Um, other than that though, I, I do like to have one ad group per campaign or I might also have a second uh, product attribute targeting uh, ad group. Um, obviously you gotta separate those out. Very good. Next okay. question, Chris. Oh, we'll get this all the time. And every, everybody in here, like the fifth or you in here, uh, feel free to write questions in the chat. Uh, put some questions that you may have in the chat, uh, anything about PPC. And then what we'll do here at the end is we'll go through those questions and we'll just fire them away at Brock and Brock will go through a little bit more in depth. Um, so this question, and this is a question we get all the time. What yeah. should my ad budget be? Yeah, so Amazon, um, you know, they, they say something like $30 a day to run all day long on a campaign. Um, so that is just a huge generalization and it totally depends on your niche and the product life cycle. If you are launching a new product, uh, it is very likely you are gonna spend dramatically more than $30 a day to start getting organic sales. Uh, you are located in the search of this page eight, page 10 on your main keywords, uh, $30 a day in a high volume niche, that's not gonna cut it. Um, I will say though, I, I have seen people maintain organic ranking um, on keywords with only $10 a day. I mean, I have seen it. Those are super specific niches and there's not as many competitors in those niches, but um, I've definitely seen some really low budget uh, campaigns be successful. So I would say when you're starting out, it is a good idea to go ahead and launch um, the budget based on what you expect to take um, to get you where you wanna be. So if you need to get to 20 sales a day, you have a 10% conversion rate and you have a dollar cost per click, that means it's gonna take $10 to get one conversion, right? So if you want 20 conversions, you can do the math. I would recommend setting your budget to at least that to start. Very good. All right, next question. Mm -hmm. When setting up a campaign, should I use dynamic up or down or dynamic down only? Yeah, this is easy. Dynamic down only. This is like, I've never I've tested over and over. I keep testing it. I'm like waiting for Amazon to up their game on this. I would love for dynamic up down to work. The concept is great. The customer comes in and buys, uh, you know, hot pink products and yours is hot pink. That's data Amazon doesn't give us, right? But we know now that this customer is more likely to buy your product because they buy everything that's hot pink, right? Um, and in theory, Amazon could see that and dynamically increase your bid. It works great when they're dynamically lowering your bid. I, I just, I cannot get it to work uh, dynamic up, down. I, I always go dynamic down only. And the only time I run the third option, which is fixed bids, uh, that is when I want total control. So such as I'm branding on a uh, I'm sorry, I'm spending on a competitor's brand or our own brand name. I don't really care if it's a lower likelihood of converting. I am buying all the traffic. And so I, I set those up as fixed bid. Um, honestly, dynamic down wouldn't be bad for those either because it only kicks in like 10% of the time. Uh, how about a follow-up on that? How would that conflict if you had dynamic up down going with when you have the optimizer running in Solozo? There could be, how does that? Affect? Yeah. Yeah, so um, the dynamic up down uh, happens after the bid. So everything that the optimizer is running in Solozo is actually the bid. So the dynamic setting is changing your bid after the fact, uh, after you've bid, you've entered that bid auction, right? Um, so how it impacts it is, is this. Uh, Solozo sees that you're bidding a dollar and you're paying $2 a click. Doesn't really care what you're bidding. If it sees you keep paying $2 a click, it's going to lower your bid from a dollar even if you were paying a dollar per click and it was profitable. So if you, if you use dynamic up down, it 
it has serious issues um, because if the issue is dynamic down, or sorry, dynamic up down, um, the optimizer is going to lower your bid to cut that wasteful spend. Uh, and, and sometimes it cuts it to the point where then the dynamics part stops kicking in and then you just stop traffic altogether. I think no matter what you are doing, do not use dynamic up down in, in 2021, at least that, that holds true. Um, and maybe 2022, they, they improve it and it starts working, but for now, 100% dynamic down only are fixed. Good stuff. Next question. Chris. Kind of back onto that. How do I use the ad placement option? Yeah. All right. So um, just to confirm, this is the top of search or product page. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, top of search, uh, there's a couple unique situations. A lot of people shop uh, Amazon mobile and um, it, it's a huge percentage of the traffic. I'm not sure what it is right now, but it, it's, I think it's over half even now. Um, I think it's been over half for a year. Anyways, point is a lot of people are coming in on mobile. And one thing to note is that mobile has fewer ad slots, um, especially at the top of the page. And so it may be more valuable for you to bump up your top of search uh, multiplier if you are selling a product that really focuses in on mobile browsers. Um, so for example, if you're selling like phone accessories, I, there's a high probability people are buying uh, phone accessories at a much higher rate from their phone. So that is a great situation where you might want to implement. Other than that, um, my general rule of thumb is don't go super high uh, unless you have a specific use for it. So when I say add one on, a lot of times I'm talking about a 10%, a 15%. I'm not talking about 200. It goes all the way up to 900, by the way. So the only time where you really want to cross over like a 30 to 50% multiplier, honestly, 50 is probably too high, is if you are trying to only bid on the top of search placement which of course is super useful if you're doing a ranking campaign because the whole goal of a ranking campaign is to trick Amazon into thinking you have a better conversion rate on, on these keywords. And so if you take your budget and you put it all towards that top of search, it increases your conversion rate on that keyword because you're only getting a high conversion rate once. Might be a higher ACoS, but the goal of this campaign is ranking, not ACoS. So that, that is a situation where I will find the bid to get me to the top of search and then I will divide it by three or four. And then I will set a three or four hundred percent multiplier to essentially achieve the same bid, but I'm not spending anywhere else. Got it. Really good. Uh, stuff. Really good. Page multiplier. Again, I almost always only stick that in like maybe 10 to 15 percent. Uh, if there's a situation where you look at the data and it's very clear you have a bump there, keep it small though. Always on product, keep it real small. Good. All right, next question. How many keywords do you suggest per research campaign? Oh man, I mean. <laughs> um, That's a good question we get all the time. Yeah, so this, I'm, I'm not going to, all right, so research campaigns would be broad or phrase match, um, mm -hmm. not exact match, or broad and phrase ad groups for that matter. Um, so the big thing about this is budget. Um, it, it's not actually a number of keywords is ideal. It's uh, the number of keywords, your cost per click, and your budget. That is really, you want to keep those three things in balance. If one of those goes out of balance, uh, that's when you start getting into issues where you're getting less than optimal data, and sometimes it's really, really bad. So a great example of that is if you have $10 a day for your broad match campaign, and you have 100 keywords, and they cost over a dollar cost per, uh, your CPC is over a dollar, I mean, you can do the math. Uh, you're not going to be able to actually test all of these keywords. Um, and so that's a situation where you have too many keywords or you have too low of a budget. So it's not that you have too many keywords. It's you have too many keywords for your budget or you don't have enough budget for your keywords. Mm -hmm. So I've seen situations where they have, you know, over a thousand keywords, no problem. And they're still running um, fine uh, in a campaign throughout the ad groups because they have so much budget. So uh, an easy calculation to do is go ahead, look what your average CPC is, uh, then go ahead and determine um, how many keywords you have that are doing discovery, meaning they haven't been fully tested, they are being discovered. And then just go ahead and say, do I even have enough for each one of these keywords to get a click? And if the answer is no, you you have too many keywords or too low a budget. That's great. All right, next question. 
Chris, you when do you get rid of a, of a research keyword that doesn't produce sales after generating expenses? All right. So if, if it's not producing sales anymore because you've discovered all of the good keywords, you've moved them to exact match, or I shouldn't say good, just all of the keywords, you've moved them over to exact match and then you've done a negative exact um, in your, your discovery or your research, your broad phrase. Um, you know, that's a situation where you, you just need to look at the cost. Uh, mm -hmm. It might be worth running a really high A cost uh, or, or spend on broader phrase match and you're discovering only one keyword a month. I mean, that might still be worth it for you if that one keyword a month you discover has a really long lifetime um, and it could be profitable still. Personally, what I say is just look at the opportunity cost. If you've got another campaign that could spend more and it's at a good A cost, why are you trying to discover new keywords whenever you can focus on the stuff you've already discovered? Good answer. Yeah, next question. When you see an ASIN with conversions in the search term report, what do you do with it? Yeah, yeah, so um, PAT, product attribute targeting, is uh, you know uh, new for 2020, I think it was. Um, maybe it came out late 2019. Um, so we can go ahead and uh, essentially do an exact match for the ASIN. So when you see an ASIN in the search term report, it means that somebody typed in something, a customer typed in something and clicked on a competing or one of your products. And then down below on the page, they actually saw your ad on sponsored related products. So that search term doesn't get passed back. The ASIN gets passed back. So um, yeah, go ahead, move those over just like you would keywords. So Ozo actually has you know, a built-in toggle where you can turn it on and the whole ad group, everything will spawn for you. Um, but yeah, go ahead, treat it like a keyword. Next okay. question. Chris, go ahead. All right, here we go. How often should I be adjusting my bids and when do I raise them up or down? Advertising automation is essential. I mean, if you're not using solos or use someone else, I, I, there's no reason you should be doing this manually. I, I mean, I, this is what solos does. So I, obviously I think daily adjustments are ideal. I don't think you have to be doing it more than daily. I mean, we've run tests, we've tried it hourly and there's absolutely no reason to be doing it more than once per day uh, in all of our tests. So, I would say that it is a good idea to do daily bid adjustments, but that's not scalable for a person. Use a tool for it and get daily bid adjustments. It's, it's necessary. You should be using your average uh, conversion rate. You should be using your average conversion value, and then you should be setting a target A cost. That's a whole nother story, but you should just be calculating where you should be bidding and you should be going for that bid. Very good. And so Dustin, right. I think I lost you there. I cut out on you a little That's bit. That's all right. Uh, I got gotcha. you. I got you covered. No problem. All right. Next question here. Chris, you can take this one. Yep. I'm getting a lot of clicks, but my conversion rate is low. How can I fix this? Well, there, there could be a lot of reasons why you have a low conversion rate. If you're getting a lot of clicks, it's normally a good sign for you know what you're, you're targeting because it means customers were at least interested enough to, to click on it, right? If you have a really poor click-through rate, then you know your main product image, your price point, and your title, something's wrong there. Um, but assuming you have a good click-through rate and you're getting a lot of clicks, but you're not getting conversions, um, a lot of times it's, it's uh, a back order. So like, go check and make sure that you have prime two-day shipping. And if you don't, it's, you're gonna get more clicks. They're gonna go to your product page and they're gonna realize, oh, I have to wait a week to get my product. You're, I, I mean, normally you have a half your conversion rate is halved whenever you don't have two-day shipping. So I, I would say go take a look at that. Um, how you fix it is just what's wrong. So if your price point is like too high, for example, you know, obviously just lower the price point or, or convey the value and why you should be at a higher price point. If it's the shipping date, I mean, we can't really control that unless we just get more inventory into Amazon. Um, and then the main image uh, is one of the most important things. A lot of people overlook that. Spend way more money on your main image. Um, because if you have a poor click-through rate, um, it's probably your title or main image. Yeah, awesome. Dustin and I see this a lot. We talk to sellers daily and, and a lot of the times they, you know, I'm, I'm running ads, I'm running ads and, and we go to find out, we look at their listing and it's more of a listing problem than it is a PPC mm -hmm. problem. So it, sometimes, you know, uh, check your listings, change your image, check a title and maybe look at your price, know your market, and then that'll help out with your ads as well.
The other thing to mention here is you could go ahead and take a look at the um, business unit session percentage. Uh, so this is essentially all of your sessions, just how they're converting on your listing. If, if that is low for your category, you know, that, that tells you that if you pay to get more people on your listing, they're not going to convert at a higher rate than the people organically getting to your listing or total. So take a look at that number and, uh, you know, kind of track that over time, that percentage, because you change your price and you have a really big hit to that conversion rate, the unit session percentage rate. Um, you know, maybe you went too far on the price or, or maybe that main photo isn't as appealing. Right. So that's definitely something to check as well. Cool. All right. We got some I, questions for you. The, the chat yeah. is blowing up. And if yeah, you've got so questions, put them in there. Yeah, we're going to, we'll get through these that we've done ourselves, but we've got a lot for you, uh, Brock. So we got to get the rapid fire going here. Uh, All right. Next, uh, next question. Would you set up variants in separate PPC campaigns or organize them in ad groups within the same campaign? Super good question. Uh, search term differentiators is what do you want to structure your campaigns based on? Um, so what that means is if everybody is typing in, you sell red socks, blue socks, ankle socks, knee socks. Uh, if everyone's typing in red socks and blue socks and they're under the same parent, their variants, put them in separate ad groups or separate campaigns, the red and the blue. Obviously knee height and ankle height isn't a search term differentiator. There's not many uh, conversions happening on those. So you can combine those and you just structure it based on color. Obviously, if it was the exact opposite, you would structure it based on that. There is benefits to having more SKUs under the same parent. So if most of the search terms are the same, they're just typing in socks when they buy, put them all together. You will optimize twice as quick by having one ad group or SKU. Boy, that's a question we get all the time. Yeah. Great answer. All right, next one. Oh, that was it. All right, here we go. I'll get us started with uh, with the questions, the great questions we have coming in from everyone here. So let's get started. All right, Brock. All right. A lot of your advice has to do with launching new products as a manufacturer. Anything you would suggest for a wholesaler distributor on Amazon? Yeah. So if you're not running a low bid catch all, just 100% do it. Um, you know, that is going to be your number one campaign as a wholesale or distributor. So uh, a low bid catch all is where you just take everything you got, put it into a single ad group. If you're over capacity, put it into two, uh, and then go ahead and set the bid anywhere from, um, the lowest I run are about six cents and the highest I run are about 15 cents. And so that is literally everything in one ad group in one campaign. And you are not optimizing that. When I say you're not optimizing, you are not transferring keywords out. This is not scalable. The whole point of this is on page seven, when somebody's just clicking around, it's still worth having a click at six cents rather than having no click at all. So uh, no brainer, get the catch all. Next thing is budget. Um, make sure that if you are running out of budget on your account, so the global budget cap in the settings page of the uh, Seller Central advertising, um, you have opportunity. Uh, if you're running out of budget, you should be using day parting. Um, so scheduling, ad scheduling, uh, or day party. Um, the other thing is just, if you are running out of budget and you have a catch-all, pause your other campaigns and just run the catch-all and, and spend on the catch-all exclusively until you get to the point where you're comfortable increasing the budget and spending on other campaigns. Perfect. Next yeah. one. What are your thoughts on using the bid down, up, down only feature? I think you talked a little bit about this, but what type of scenarios would you use these effectively? Yeah, don't use the up down. I, I, I've tested it so many times. I've done so many different niches. I have never once seen better performance from it. Um, I even tried it around prime day, like they suggested around the holidays. I don't know what they got going on. Use dynamic down only. I, and what, and what, just to add to that, what we tell sellers is doesn't know your target ACOS. They don't know your ACOS goal. So they're going to continue to raise that <laughs> bid as high as it can go just to get a conversion. And, and sometimes that can get out of whack. So just be careful there. And in our test, we found that like 80 to 90% of the time, they were increasing it by the full multiplier. So they were increasing 100%, 80 to 90% of the time. So you're telling me 80 to 90% of the clicks I'm getting, you think they're going to convert at such a high rate, this is okay to go up 100%? Yeah. <laughs> Don't use it. Use dynamic down only. <laughs> Great stuff. All right, next question. Do you need to repeatedly put the same negative keywords on each campaign or only need to put it once in a campaign? Well, I, I prefer to add negative keywords at the ad group level. And so if you do have multiple ad groups, um, you know, you will have to put it multiple times um, technically in the campaign. 
Um, but you really only have to create a negative keyword once. Uh, it doesn't, you know, you can't create them twice. Uh, if you are launching new campaigns and you have like a blacklist, you know these keywords are bad because of your product. I mean, of course you could launch the campaign with the negatives, but otherwise you just have to put them in once. This next one, we get a lot too. This is gonna be a good one. I'm hope you're ready for it, Brock. <laughs> What's the difference between Solozology and Quartiles? Oh, um, well, we're, we're a pretty firm believer in, in uh, more of a consolidated campaign structure. Um, so, I mean, one of the biggest things is, is we, we're not going to make a mess of your campaigns to the point where you don't know what's going on. Um, that's, that's probably the number one reason we get people switching. Um, I, I would say that just looking at the single keyword isolation approach, you know, I, I'll be honest, it sounds like a really great idea on paper. Um, you know, if you pitched it to me and I had no prior experience, um, you know, I, I would probably think that sounds great. The problem is it gets out of hand really quick. And then you also have, it's not true competition between, by the way, what I mean by keyword isolation is um, keywords per campaign instead of having a campaign with lots of keywords. So um, it gets out of hand really quick. Uh, and then it also is really tough to actually figure out what has gone wrong. So for example, if there's a big change and your ACOS starts going up, if you've got 200 campaigns for a product, it's just extremely tough um, to actually work on it. Mm -hmm. um, and then also there's really not a reason. So for example, if you put your budget, uh, what you're willing to spend on this product at the manual campaign, your exact match, and it has hundreds of keywords in it, it's gonna spend on what's working the best. You know, instead of controlling the budget at the keyword level, why not just set the bid to the perfect bid to hit your target A cost for every single keyword and then let it spend based on what's performing the best? You know, like you're not actually getting a benefit by separating the budget out because then if one of them runs out of budget, you can't keep spending. So yeah, big fan of having more consolidated campaign structures as well as multiple keywords in a single campaign. And that, that works long-term much better for long-term management and monitoring and seeing what changes are happening. That's a great breakdown, Brock, of that. Um, all right, next question. What's a good PPC strategy for a new product launch? Uh, what niche? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. If, you, if you're really niche down and there's only a couple competitors, I, I mean, you might be able just to launch the product with an auto to exact match campaign, do an early review program, and, and um, you know, you might be able to hit the ground running with that no problem. That's probably the most common way to do it. Um, obviously get your reviews in order, you know, all the outside stuff from PPC. Um, the other approach is let's say you're in a super competitive niche. I mean, like a brutally competitive one, some of the supplement space, some of the, the, the tough ones, um, those competitive niches, you might actually skip keyword discovery and just right off, off the, the, the day one, pick keywords you're going to rank for and go ahead and set up a ranking campaign. So if you only have $30 a day, and you're in a tough niche where you know you can spend all $30 a day, you, sh you might want to put the entire budget to a single keyword to try to get organic ranking because you don't have the budget to do discovery. That's, that's a question niche we get is all lighting fixtures. Lighting fixtures. Okay. Um, all right. So if you're more premium lighting fixtures and you're doing like merchant fulfilled, um, I definitely think you're going to want to probably do a different approach. So instead of, automatic to exact match. Go ahead and get one of those in. Um, but if you've got other listings that are doing well, you probably want to try something such as like a comparison module on your enhanced brand content, cross promote your new products. Because if somebody's looking at one of your existing products that's doing well, um, they might be more interested in one of your new ones. And that is a free click. You don't have to pay for that. The other one is the virtual bundle. Uh, even if you're selling lighting fixtures and you think people aren't going to bundle two together, uh, there's benefits because it's essentially a free banner ad that's highlighting your new products. I love doing this in essentially all niches where it's, it's not as high velocity. Cheap lighting fixtures is a little different. If you're going for cheap lighting fixtures, um, you know, maybe do an auto do exact match right off the bat as well. Um, you know, this is the high volume ones. These are the 19 to $30 ones. If you're high volume, you might also want to look at a piggybacking approach where you target some ASINs and that are high volume that you think you're uniquely fit to compete with. So like they look really similar, but yours is cheaper or you have better reviews. 
piggyback on those, use a uh, product attribute targeting and just target a handful of ASINs, that's another great way to start getting immediate exposure that's more cost effective because um, obviously you might not have the budget to go for the high volume keywords from day one. And we work with probably the largest lighting company on Amazon. You can go to our site and see who that is. But so we got a lot of, uh, we got a lot of experience in this particular niche. Uh, yeah. Okay, here we go. Amazon ad specialist is saying I should not have so many campaigns. They suggested that I only have three campaigns to avoid the same keyword in different campaigns competing against each other. All right. So if you're talking about an Amazon employed, uh, <laughs> let's be clear that those are salespeople. Uh, nothing against salespeople. Um, but they, take it easy over there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, I, I was, I used to live with one of these guys. I'm going to be blunt. Uh, I, I was out in the Bay Area and I lived with multiple people that worked at Amazon and I actually did work with somebody that that's, that was their job. Um, you know, it's a sales position and um, they have KPIs and one of those KPIs uh, is actually to get you to try to use some, some different campaign types. So definitely make sure you understand that, you know, um, Amazon's goal is to get you to spend more. Um, and so be careful about suggestions. Uh, now, for the specific question, um, if you're using exact negatives, you never have that problem. So if you're using a, um, a system with keyword transfer, that, that you can just let them know that can't happen. Um, when the search term converts in the exact match, for example, it will be created as a negative exact in the automatic or the broad or the phrase. So there's, you can just let them know I have a, a tool that's running that will take care of that and you won't have to work. Now, if that is happening because of some other reason, it's also, you, you're not actually competing. Competing is the wrong word. You will not bid yourself up unless you have multiple seller accounts. So you pay one penny higher than the next highest bidder, not the next highest campaign. You are the bidder. So uh, one thing I would mention is the reason why you don't want to have the same keyword in multiple campaigns targeting the same search term. So if they're targeting different search terms, it's different, but targeting the same search term is because you're dividing the data between two points. So what can happen is you lower the bid in one place, then the volume, all the higher cost per clicks, the less profitable, lower conversion rate ones maybe, those bounce over to the next one. And so you're like playing a whack-a-mole game where you're bouncing back and forth. Again, if you have a, a campaign structure that's actually sending it all to exact match down like a discovery pipeline, this can't happen. All right, I'm take a, a drink of water. We got another question for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, here we go. Uh, this is from Brian. I use dynamic up down when I'm running a lightning deal and it worked really well. And then a second question, or do you have any insights on the best times of day to run your ads? So the lightning deal is interesting. Um, I almost think that you could have been running at a much higher bid and done really profitable while you were doing a lightning deal. So it wasn't the dynamic up down that actually worked. What happened is you were just paying 100% higher for a lot more clicks. And since you had a, a much better uh, conversion rate, I'm, I'm assuming here, um, when you're running the lightning deal, because people click on it, they see that it's a lightning deal, so the conversion rate's better. Um, I actually think that it wasn't the up-down that, that had success. I actually think what it was was just the fact you were bidding higher. So my my take would be just bid higher. I go ahead and put on a multiplier, put on a top of search multiplier for that one lightning deal day, or go in and use our relative bid adjustments. You know, you can go in there and change all of your bids 50% for one day and then drop them down 50% the next after the deal runs out. I would, I would, be very surprised if you did not have the same performance by just increasing your bids for the day you know you're going to have a better conversion. Good answer there. Okay, this is a good one. Okay. I noticed since starting using Solozo that my keyword bids are way higher than what Amazon recommends. For example, Amazon recommends $3, but sometimes Solozo bid is at 6 What's the reason for this? Well, so the first thing is Amazon... Um, they're not actually telling you the bid you need. They don't know your ACOS target. They don't know your conversion rate. Uh, they're actually suggesting a bid based on getting you to pay for it. Um, so keep in mind, they're suggesting a recommended bid. It is just to get to page one. It is not actually based on your conversion rate. It is not based on an ACOS target. It is not based on any data that you really need to calculate to set an ideal bid. Um, so, you know, keep that in mind. Um, Salozo is setting your bid based on uh, a variety of different things. Uh, it's looking at, you know, how, 
first off, what target A cost do you have? Most important. And then it's looking at your conversion rate and it's looking at the conversion value. Um, and it's weighting those based on the more recent data. So it's actually setting your bid to hit your target A cost. Now, it sounds like in this specific example, what's going on is actually keyword testing. So um, if, if it's doing keyword testing, uh, it's going to raise the bid trying to get to enough clicks to say that it has enough data. So in this specific situation, I would recommend this user take a look at, first off, how much spend is actually going through. Just because you're bidding $6 doesn't necessarily mean you're paying $6 or you're paying at all. Um, the next thing I would look at is, is there a reason you're not getting data? Is it because you've changed your backend search terms and like now your relevancy score is too low on this keyword and so we can't get clicks. So the optimizer is trying to, but it can't because uh, Amazon thinks you are not relevant enough on this term. Or is it because of the budget thing I mentioned earlier and you're actually out of budget. And so there's, there's just not budget to actually test this keyword, which obviously if you fix the budget, the bid wouldn't uh, have to get up so high to get data. It's a great answer. We get that question all the time um, about that. All right, next one. <clears throat> what kind of keyword do you put in research campaign? Only root keyword? Um, no, I, I, I actually like, uh, I, I like to do uh, automation. I like to do Amazon advertising automation for discovery, optimization. I, there's no reason not to. So what I do is when search terms convert, I move them over. Um, now, if, if you're in a situation where you can't be doing that much keyword testing, say you are, you know, let's, you got a limited budget, right? Um, that's a situation where maybe you pick just some top root, root, uh, broad match or phrase match, go ahead, throw those in there. Maybe just keep 10, don't do any keyword transfer to the discovery campaign, just pull out from it and maybe run that from the beginning, just do some limited discovery. Um, to be honest, though, if you're limited on budget, you might just want to stick to the automatic campaign, transfer into an exact match, max that out, and then say, okay, now I'm going to do broad match. Good stuff. How can, a, how can a newbie, I'm a newbie to PPC. I've been burned by companies before, but I need to know and I need help. I'm a big fan of Tatiana, and that's what brings me here. Uh, Renee, reach out to Dustin and I. Go to thesalozo.com, book a demo. Uh, we have a program for new sellers uh, that's not on the site yet. It's a, it's a new program we got coming out. Uh, go check that out. You would be a perfect fit. Dustin, go ahead. All right. Next question. What kind of keywords do you consider is a good discover on research campaign? What do you do with it? How high is the bid you put on it? So are, are we talking like comparing between broad or phrase? I'm guessing. I'm guessing. Yeah. Imagine, I'm assuming. So yeah. 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 Okay. So um, which match type to use? I use them both. Um, broad match, uh, lately I have been seeing better performance with broad over phrase match for discovery. Obviously the highest level of keyword testing you can do is doing an automatic to a broad, broad to a phrase, phrase to an exact. I only recommend that if you're having trouble spending enough. If you are spending all of your budget, do not do maximum keyword testing. There is you know, not a benefit. Um, focus on the exact match you've already discovered. Um, so I would say if you are going to pick one of them, maybe test out broad match, see how the performance is, see how the new keywords um, that are being transferred over to your exact match, see if it's enough for you. Um, phrase match uh, can work much better than broad for certain niches. Um, some niches just have so much crossover with another niche that sells a totally different product, but the words are very similar and you, you could end up having a lot of wasteful spend. So certain niches do much better with phrase match for discovery because there's so much crossover with another niche. Test broad to start. Perfect. What are your thoughts on running and Brian asked this, what are your thoughts on running uh, coupons or lightning deals? When or how often would you recommend running these? <laughs> Okay, so um, if you're uh, a fan of sponsored display ads, don't, don't panic. Sponsored display ads, they do have a new beta out, uh, sponsored display product targeting. And this is totally different performance than a normal sponsored display audience targeting ad. Um, I hate sponsored display audience targeting. I, I only run a handful of them profitably or where we need to be. Uh, I do love stacking sponsored display product targeting with coupons though. And the reason being is I, I love that badge, how it shows up. And I like how most of the display ads are showing right below the buy box or the bullet points on your competitors listings. 
So when you're doing sponsored display product targeting, you can pick those competitors you know you do really well against, you have a good offering against it. And that coupon is golden when you're doing that kind of an approach. So definitely consider it there. Um, lightning deals are tough. Um, so many times lightning deals are, are awful and you get nothing out of it. I, I would say more often than not. That having said, I also have seen some of the biggest sales days on any account of all time, like insane numbers when we do a lightning deal. The thing is the lightning deal, it's on a product that already sells really, really well. And it's a big discount. So like if you have excess inventory and you need to move this stuff, think about a really good lightning deal offer, right? Um, other than that, definitely look at just manipulating your price to get the discount badge. You know, that's, that's pretty popular these days. Um, and it's probably just as effective as the coupon. Um, and I think most people, if you're having trouble moving, um, inventory, a lightning deal is not going to be great for you. You're not going to have much better results. So definitely look at why you're not moving velocity instead of just paying for it. I'm with you, Brock. I, I, I've run lightning deals all the time and some, they just don't perform as well as you, as it used to. And something that you can kind of get stuck on is if you do coupons and lightning deal, be careful because you, you, they're going to, they're going to clip that coupon as well. Yeah. And you're just kind of really losing money. So, uh, and, and again, subscribe and save products. I'm a big fan of these, uh, you know, run a coupon all the time because it's going to help you get more subscriptions. So. Oh, one other thing to mention, um, the lightning deal, the, the most uh, successful lightning deals I've seen are always uh, industry leaders. So in your top row, you're like the top four products. Those are always the lightning deals that do the best. So if you're like number one in, for your main keyword and you see that you drop down to like four or five, you're like in the second row now, that is a great opportunity to run a lightning deal and bump yourself right back up to the top. So defending your number one organic position, you're like a big velocity seller. That Those are the ones that do well. Yep, for sure. Keep it rolling, uh, Dustin. All right, here we go. If I have a parent listing with many child listings, should I only put one child listing into the campaign or should I add all of them? Another okay. question get all the time. Great question. Yeah. And it's kind of like an anchor skew approach is I think what they're referring to. So an anchor skew is a skew, a child variation under your parent that performs better. Maybe it's a color variation. Maybe it's because it's a cheaper price than the rest of the variations. Um, there, there are more often than not, you will have better performance just promoting your anchor skew than promoting all of your skews. Um, a one pack and a two pack is a great example. Don't promote your two pack if your one pack is merged under the same listing and has, you know, significantly better click through rate, right? If they want a two pack, they'll see it there. And then, you know, you got the better click through rate and more total impressions on the listing. There are some caveats if the products are, are totally unique. I mean, you might have to promote them all, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Robert says, would you run a low bid catch all alongside your individual auto campaigns for each of those products? Absolutely. Not for each of the products. I have one catch-all with all products in it. And yes, um, I also run a normal uh, automatic, which is a optimization, a discovery campaign, right? So the catch-all is going to be bidding between six and, and 15 cents, no matter what. You, you, you should put in a map. If you're using the optimizer, first off, make sure you go into campaign studio and remove keyword transfer and make sure you put in a max bid of 15 cents or 20 for certain categories. But the reason you want to do this is your automatic campaign that you're optimizing and you're transferring keywords over to a manual, the goal of that is, is discovery. The goal of the catch-all campaign is to be spending 24 seven on really low hanging fruit that are really cheap. And so if your other campaigns run on a budget, you wanna make sure your catch-all has enough budget to run 24 seven. And that is a perfect example why you wanna run them both. We got about 10 minutes left. Yep, yeah, we'll crank down a few more questions here. Uh, this is another one we get all the time. What are your thoughts on day parting? Does it work? And what are the best scenarios to use it? Oh, I, yeah. I, advertising, Amazon advertising, ad scheduling or day parting, whatever you want to call it, I use it. Um, so uh, you need, just like the top of search multiplier or the product page multiplier, uh, have a justification for using it. But there are a lot of them. Uh, number one use case is you're running out of budget. If you are um, an ad manager for a company and you have a very restricted budget, say, um, and you're running out of budget by 6 a.m., 
go ahead and day part, right? Like you're not at, unless, unless morning, middle of the night and morning are your peak hours, which I highly doubt, um, you're not going to have good results. Let's say you're selling office supply products, put your whole budget Monday to Friday. I mean, simple eight to five, right? Or yeah, eight to five. Well, plus specific East coast times, you know, but yeah, you definitely should be using that for budget reasons. The other one is uh, cloning the campaign and then day parting it to figure out what time of day you're more effective. So really good for A-B testing. Say you're changing some of your copy or something like that, um, day parting it so both campaigns can run at the same time or you know hour to hour, uh, really, really useful. So that's another great one. Can you talk about how you're leveraging sponsored display for remarketing? Are you running unique campaigns for each option, like similar versus your products? Uh, so I'm not having the best performance with those. I'll be honest, I, um, I really, really stick to sponsored display product targeting ads. Um, the remarketing, I've had some success, but it's just so limited. Uh, I'll be honest, unless you're maxing everything else out, I normally would put your budget somewhere else, like sponsor brand video ads. If, if you're looking at you know, switching from just sponsored products or normal traditional headline search sponsor brand ads, you know, don't go for the display retargeting, go for sponsor brand video instead, go for sponsored display product targeting. Um, we see over and over and over and over significantly better performance. All right, next one here. We used the Amazon attribution tool to help track traffic from sources like Facebook, Google, and TikTok ads, but the data seemed really out of whack. Have you seen this work or do you have thoughts on the attribution tool? And can you talk about your thoughts on running ads using category targeting, sponsor brand and sponsor display? So I'm definitely not an expert in the attribution tool. I, I wouldn't be able to tell you if the data I've seen is inaccurate. I've definitely seen accounts where it looks accurate. So I, I don't think like widespread is just not working. Um, I definitely have heard though of situations where it, it just is impossible um, to see the data that you're seeing. So um, I would say that any data from Amazon is good data. The more data we can get, the better. So I would use it, it's free, why not? Um, but yeah, I, I, don't, I can't tell you that it, it's actually working. Uh, what was the second part? The second part was talk about your thoughts on running ads using category targeting, sponsored brand and sponsored display. Yeah, so category targeting is definitely something that I think is going to be growing this year. Um, I used it to a limited degree um, in 2020, definitely wasn't the best performance. Uh, that having said, I think I really need to re-evaluate it. And the reason I say that is if you're running the optimizer for six months um, and you're harvest or you're manually pulling out all of your converting search terms from automatic campaigns to your exact match, your automatic campaign is gonna get worse and worse and worse, right? But that's good because you're discovering keywords, you're moving them over to your exact match and you're optimizing. That's the point, you're discovering. So I really think I need to be looking at the category targets with a different uh, expectation because even though they are running at a higher target A cost normally or higher A cost than target, um, if I view them as a way to discover specific ASINs and transfer that to an exact match ASIN uh, ad group, I actually think that could be really profitable. So I would say, you know, go ahead and use that as a way to discover new ASINs, but make sure you also are discovering ASINs from your automatic because those are normally really profitable compared to category. Good, all right, next one. What are your thoughts on pricing? Should I increase my price so that I can spend more on ads or will that lower my conversion rate? How do you determine a happy medium? <laughs> Good question. Yeah. Um, what is it, an incrementality test, right? So you can just test it. Uh, there's uh, uh, definitely some options out there. Um, the other thing to do is uh, look at your competitors, you know, type in your main keyword. And if all of your competitors are, you know, significantly higher priced than you, I, I think it's a no brainer that you can go ahead and raise it. Hmm. If the exact opposite is true, you, you really wanna think, okay, do I have a reason why I'm a higher price? And is that reason apparent from the SERP? because it really has to be apparent from the SERP. So that's like your main uh, image and your title or the first part of your title. They need to tell the customer why you're higher priced. Otherwise, you're probably not pricing accordingly, you know? Brian, that's your question. You also asked the question about coupons. So maybe you could try you know, having a, a higher price and throw a coupon on there. Um, 
that mm-hmm. might work as well. So check check that out. Okay. Uh, here we go. Good question. This is probably the best question of the night. Okay. Where where can I see a Solozo demo? <laughs> I'm not doing that one. <laughs> Go to slozo.com, S-E-L-L-O-Z-O.com. You'll see a button up the top right. It says start a trial or book a demo. You're going to get Dustin and I, and we're going to go through the, the platform with you, answer questions just like this, and just kind of see where you're at. So uh, go to slozo.com. Okay. Can you talk more about sponsored video ads? Use them. Use them. Oh, they're great. They're amazing. Um, reach out to us if you need a videographer. We will refer ones that we have had positive experiences with them. Um, it is rare that I cannot get a sponsored brand video to significantly outperform sponsored product. Simple mm-hmm. as that. So, um, technique. Yeah, I'm with you. Use yeah. them. Like exact match. Um, don't, don't dump broad match keywords into your sponsor brand. Um, any of them for that matter. Um, you know, stick with exact match and then selectively use broader phrase. Cause you know, we can't have separate ad groups for each of those. Uh, other than that, um, you need to have text, closed captioning. You have to actually have text in the video saying why they need to buy your product. Uh, and then lifestyle, use those two things. Mash your lifestyle with your product differentiator as text on screen. And the reason for that is of course, um, people are not turning on the audio. Um, you know, They have to actually turn on audio. So if you just have audio talking about your differentiator, why they're gonna buy your product, I'd say nine out of 10, eight out of 10 people are not gonna see it. Got about five minutes left. Okay. Yep, All right. we'll do just these last two questions and then we'll uh, we'll wrap it up. All right, thoughts on using Amazon DSP? Well, um, you know, I'm not an expert in it. It's still very new as far as like all the new iteration at least. Um, you know, my big thing is just make sure you have a reason to do it. You know, we, we have not, there's only a couple uh, brands that I work with that have seen better as good, I should say as good performance on, on the demand side platform compared to, you know, what you can do in just the normal seller central vendor central advertising console. So uh, I would say, make sure you're maxing out before you go into, into DSP, because when you go into Google, you search for something. You know, when you type in dog food into Google, you might be looking for it locally. You might be trying to research it. You might be trying to find a different brand, right? When somebody goes on to Amazon and they type in dog food, they're getting a bag of dog food at their door in 48 hours, you know? So I I just, I know Amazon's pushing it really, really hard, but just keep in mind what it is, right? Um, It's very likely you should focus first on maxing out what you can do with your on-platform in your, in your seller central or vendor central account before going that direction. Good answer there. Okay. So I have a exact match campaign in a keyword. At what point do I know that I don't need to raise my bid anymore? Um, well, <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, <coughs> so I, I would say that, you know, your target a cost is being met. So, if you have a 20% target A cost and you're at a 20%, that's that's where your bid needs to be. Um, if, if you have a 50% target A cost and you're at 20, you should probably raise your bid. And if you're already the highest bidder, well, you're just gonna defend your highest spot up to a higher level. You only pay one penny higher than the next highest bidder. So there's really not a downside of raising that bid up. Now, you should probably have like a max reasonable bid, um, but at the same time, there, there are benefits of having a really high bid, even though your CPC is really low, and that's to defend. So if somebody else adds that keyword in, they're going to think it's a really bad keyword because uh, they're going to pay a super high CPC, where you know you've got six months of performance at a low CPC, and this is just a temporary blip. So take a look at your target A costs and, um, you know, don't, don't be afraid to have a higher bid than what you need to be. If you're already the highest bidder. Brock, you did it. That was rapid real? fire. Okay. Quick, good <laughs> answers. That was awesome. Kim, can you go to the next slide real quick? And uh, we'll, we'll wrap this up, but Brock, that was amazing, uh, information. Thanks so much. One more question, guys. Oh, was there one more? Oh, here it is. One your main image. Question. You mentioned oh, your main image. Amazon wants your product on a white background. How do we improve that? How do we, Solozo, or just like in general? In general. Okay. Because I was going to say, um, 
So one thing to mention is that uh, they are guidelines. Um, they're, they're literally called guidelines, uh, photo guidelines. And uh, any search you go into Amazon and, and type something in, I can guarantee you in the top 10, you will have probably a majority see something that violates those guidelines. Um, product uh, packaging, for example, um, great option. Um, if you're lifestyle, I've seen people get away with it. To be totally honest, this is one of those situations where I, I side on asking for forgiveness rather than permission. And, uh, you know, if they come after me and I got six months of a lifestyle image, um, you know, they might take me down one day and then I swap it out. Uh, I, I'm not going to tell you to do that, but I would definitely say you, you don't get suspended for changing your main image unless you really, really like put something wrong. In. So push those guidelines uh, as much as, as you can. And um, there's a lot of YouTube videos specifically about how you can push them. So take, take uh, some time, research it, and I'm sure you'll see something. Good stuff. Yeah, that is. All right. Well, I know we have a lot of people on here that uh, are not currently using Solozo. If this is something you would like to look at uh, to help you automate this entire process that Brock has been describing, you can go to solozo.com and book a demo with Chris or I. We'll talk about anything in your Amazon business, show you a demo of the platform and how it's going to automate this optimization process. Also, if you're an existing client on Solozo and you've been listening to Brock and you realize, man, he knows what he's talking about. I want that managing my campaigns and that our support team is amazing. Brock's in charge of them. We can upgrade you to fully managed. You can again, uh, get in touch with either Chris or I, and we can discuss what that looks like to upgrade you to fully managed. So you can get that level of expertise managing your PPC.